Hello, everyone. This is J.D. Carlo, and this is Indie Comics Explain. And yet again, I brought another fantastic group of independent comic book professionals. And let me tell you something. Tonight, Jay's not here. So this will be a really good show. Anyway, so without further ado, let's bring on our co-host for the night. Mr. Tom Hutchins. Captain co-host. Thank you, J.D. Appreciate the mm -hmm. invite, as always. Tom Hutchison, Big Dog Inc. writer, uh, publisher, um, art director, shipping guy all things big dog inc um we'll have uh we're, we're a week out from uh launching the next uh critter campaign april 6 for critter number 23. very nice very nice no, first guess what's up peter oh hey hey peter bro uh comic book creator um a little bit about myself i've i i've, I've written titles for antarctic press Caliber Comics. Uh, I wrote, uh, sold out, you know, best-selling series these damn kids for Second Sight, and I'm now have two monthly titles coming out, starting in the month of May, you know, with Blood Moon Comics. All right, cool. And Peter, you still got the coolest name in comics. Bro. Yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> All right. Here we have Aaron. What's up, Aaron? Oh, uh, nothing much. Uh, I'm the creator of, well, God, lots of stuff. Writer, uh, creator, illustrator. Okay, I'm getting some weird, I apologize. Like, it's catching up with, it's weird. Okay, we'll do this this way. Yeah, writer, illustrator, <laughs> creator of uh, my God from Goblins. I'm doing Knocked right now, which your new issue just came out on the store. So um, I'm here to pitch the newest issue, and I'm working on issue three as we speak. Cool, cool, cool. So, um, hmm. What's up, Sean? Uh, I'm Sean Wood. I am the writer for The Fog Within 1 and 2. All right, cool. Who fell out? Somebody fell out. And hey everybody, I'm David Whalen. Uh, I'm the uh, uh, pr the owner of Correct Handed Comics, correcthandedcomics.com. I have uh, issues one through 25 of our uh, ongoing series, The Offspring, that just got collected in uh, our Omnibus Volume 2. And last week, I just put out our second 100-plus uh, page graphic novel, Late and Lightspeed. And you can find it all on correcthandedcomics.com. Right, cool. And we have... What's up, Dennis? How you doing? Oh, busy, busy, busy. It's the last day of the Kickstarter, so just trying to, you know, <laughs> wait the clock out at this point. Gotcha. Do me a favor. Put the link in the in the private chat, all right? Sure. And uh, and and while you're doing that, if you can, uh, introduce yourself, sir. Sure. So my name is Dennis Robinson. I'm the writer creator of the graphic novel series Lycan Solomon's Odyssey. First two books are already out. Third one, as I just mentioned, is on Kickstarter at lycanbook.com and it runs until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. So we are already successful. It's our third successful Kickstarter. Um, so now we're just working on stretch goals. All right. Very nice. Very nice. All right, gentlemen. So let's get down to brass tacks. Uh, as they say, the show question. Uh, what's up, Carlos? So the show question is, ego, how much do you have? How much do you need? Right? So we all know we need a certain amount of ego to be in this business. <laughs> but how much do you really need? Right? So uh, let's start it off. Let, let's go with Dennis. How do you feel about that? Uh, well, so that's a tough one because I am typically very self-deprecating. So <laughs> in terms of my ego, it goes as far as me just knowing that it's a good book. But I don't really get that much of a, a big head about uh, things in terms of like how much ego should you have? Well, that kind of also depends on what you're trying to do. Like, uh, for instance, you know, I go to conventions a lot, a lot more than I care to <laughs> to <laughs> sell the books. And I did 27 last year. And the people I notice who do the best at shows like that are people like uh, my first editor, Henri Kumpen, who is just ego out the wazoo, like the most confident human being you'll ever meet. And he can get out there and he can do like the carnival barky type of thing. And he'll flip thousands of books in a single show. It's not my personality type. I just can't do that. 
basically I wait until somebody kind of lingers at the table for a little bit. And then I go into the pitch and, you know, try and let the book do the talking for itself a little bit. Like I give them the elevator pitch, but the, the whole point of that is to just get them to pick up the book and look at it because I think the art stands on its own. So that's sort of like the gateway to get people in. So I would say ego is important if it, but it, it depends on what your goals are and how you operate. I would say. All right. Fair enough. Sean, what are your thoughts? So I'd say with ego, I need more ego, honestly, because um, I'm still the new guy. So I'm trying to prove myself. So if I come out swinging like, hey, I'm the greatest thing ever, no one's ever going to look at my book. Uh, so I can't do that. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say uh, middle ground. So when you when you have a ton of books, you can have more ego because you have more fans. You have that longevity. I mean, you've already proven yourself. So it's not not bragging where you shouldn't be bragging you you should be bragging at that point um but i, I need definitely a lot more uh, ego and to uh dennis's point actually um he got me at baltimore uh i wasn't even oh. i was just walking <laughs> down he's like hey you need a bag for that poster and that's how he oh, got yeah. me in and I got, I got your book so uh it worked <laughs> that's another way to get people to stop is to give them like yeah. free bags and sleeves and stuff <laughs> yeah. nice all right cool uh, David, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with what everybody just said. I also think that on some level, it's a fake it till you make it situation. Uh, sometimes you're sitting there drawing, you're like, gosh, I'm really getting it done. This is the best thing I've ever done. And done. you get two panels uh, uh, after that one, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm the worst. So it's, uh, it's a matter of just continuing to move forward. I think for comic book creators, uh, especially when you're just getting started, the hardest part is is just the getting started, the saying, I think I've got a good idea. I, I, I know I can draw, let's just keep going. Uh, and I would say that maybe I'm gonna ex uh, make the number a little too big here, but I'd say probably 80 to 85% of the people that get started stop because they don't feel like they're moving, pro progressing forward the way they'd want to. Um, it's the, the rest of the people that keep moving forward and keep getting better and better and better. And I think that's uh, a lot of times where that ego comes in going, gosh, it's, it's not perfect now, but if I just keep going, I can keep trucking it out, keep getting books out, keep uh, getting good stuff out. Um, and the, the, the confidence starts to grow with that. All right, cool. Aaron, what are your thoughts? As far as marketing, I have no ego in that area because I'm not good at it at all. As far as an artist, yeah, because I don't. I've had I've worked with other people. I don't play well with others because I usually have an idea. Since I finish so much of my artwork on my own and do my writing, I know the goal I'm looking for. And most people who mess with my stuff, give it to a colors, whatever. I'm like, mm, no, that and it just it kind of sucks all the wind out of me. Uh, so that's probably something I need to let go of to get further along. Uh, but I don't know. I still do everything myself, even figured out the coloring. So I do coloring, I do it all. Um, I don't know. I've always just kind of been like, I know what I want. I know what I'm trying to execute. And like, cause I've had some people do some color stuff and I'm just like, I remember telling one lady, no, these are the colors you use. And she came back with totally different colors. So I'm like, I'm like, fine, whatever you want to do, go for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I gave up. I also work pretty fast as far as my work ethics. I don't like people who don't get their stuff done. So if you're not going to get it done, I'm just going to do it for you and leave you behind. I'm, I'm not going to wait for you. So. All right, cool. Peter, what are your thoughts? I, I think I think a little bit of ego is not a bad thing. Um, you know, I um, I'll tell you a short little story. Um, about five years ago, they had a, a local contest for the Fundy Fan Fest, and it's a local. Uh, um, it was a big comic convention for the city, and they had a contest, and it was like you know create the character for the Fundy Fan Fest, and you'd have you, what, one of the things you had to do was you had to go and pitch it to the like knuckle down studios heroes beacon bell alliance which is it was the big sponsor for it and i had no idea what i was doing and and i went in there and just bullshit my way through this meeting and they said yeah okay you can be part of the contest and then i, I won the contest so it was a nice little ego boost but i i did realize that after the fact that if i want to work as part of a team then i better keep the ego in check right because 
you know, like for me, comics is a, is a team effort. It's not a, it, it's not, it's, it's not an I thing, right? Like I'm, I couldn't draw a stick man, save my life. Right. You know, so I have to, you know, get along with the artists that I work with. Right. Or I'll, no one would ever want to do anything with me. Right. You know, and I've been mm -hmm. blessed enough to, you know, work with some really good artists over the years. Eh? You know, and uh, if I was a tyrannical maniac who, you know, thought it was, you know, oh, no, you didn't draw that right, or you didn't do this, or you didn't do that, or like, you know, whatever I think, this is what I think you mean by ego, right? You know what I mean? Then, then geez, I, all I'd ever hear is crickets, and nobody would ever want to play with me, right? So I have to, you know, be able to <clears throat> keep that that part of me in check, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Fair enough. Mr. Hutchison, what are your thoughts? Okay, so this is this is a really interesting conversation. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm going to go in a direction here. We're going to take this a little deeper, and and really the only person here that talked about it really was David, um, because to me there's a difference and there's a really fine line between ego and egotistical. Really, is what we're talking mm -hmm. about, like taking that into a long, long realm, and confidence, which is the other side of that coin, and. Right. I think a lot of people struggle with understanding confidence versus ego. And we've seen this for decades upon decades in the comic industry, because we'll see guys like uh, Rob Liefeld, Todd McFarlane being called, Oh, these guys are dicks. These guys are assholes. They're all egomaniacs. I'm like, these guys are confident in what they do. Now that doesn't mean they're not dicks too on occasion, but it starts with confidence. Right. And, and, these guys have confidence in themselves and what they do. I mean, you've heard the stories of, of Todd going in and they're telling him like, now you're not doing these spaghetti webbings anymore. And he's like, yes, I am. I'm going to do these spaghetti webbings and this is what we're going to get. And he changes the way things are done. Right. And that's, that's sort of a confidence slash leadership role within his world, that art world. And I think that a lot of people uh, that are particularly people that are just coming in to comics, making their own stuff, especially um, they don't have the confidence level yet to um, kind of, and we've discussed a little bit on this panel already, we, we kind of had this lack of confidence. So we start, I hear a lot of, um, what's the term, um, uh, what's, what's, what's the term where people are, the, the complex, the inferiority complex, right? Mm -hmm. We see a lot of people that come in and even though they're like, oh, I like what I did, they get into this and they start to see other people's work and they start to compare their stuff to other people's work. And they start to be like, oh my God, I'm not as good as David. I'm not as good as Sean. Something's wrong here. But what you have to have is confidence in yourself. It doesn't matter if you're better than David or Sean. It only matters that you're good within yourself, mm -hmm. right? You have to have confidence in yourself, your book, your artist, your colorist, your printer, uh, your letterer. As long as you have the confidence to then step up, particularly like at a con and, and say like, look, here's my book. I want you to look at it. I want you to see the characters. I want to tell you about this story. That's what we all want and need within ourselves. And there are levels of confidence, of course. Um, but I think that the ego part um, is where we can run into problems uh, if the ego sort of jumps the shark. Um, confidence, high confidence is great. I love working with artists that have high confidence. Dude, I need you to draw this and this and the car and it's upside down and whatever. And the artist is like, yeah, man, I got you. Let's let's do this. Uh, but then I have artists over the years who have basically told me uh, what they're going to do. And I'm like, well, that's not what I want. You have to mm -hmm. understand, I'm paying you. I need what I need so that I can then sell it down the line. I'll listen to your thought process. Tell me what you think. But at the end of the day, I have to make the decision that's best for the business. And if you as a, a hired gun uh, are, are swirling in your ego as I'm only going to do it this way, that's called ultimatums. And you are probably going to lose 90% of the time hmm. because most people are, that have the confidence in what they're doing are going to be like, look, this is not working. I need what I need and I'm paying you for what I need. So... Um, and I've, I've had that a number of times with a number of people. And I was just like, look, that's it. We're done. I, for every, every person that's going to give me that ego and that attitude, there's 20 guys behind him in line that I can just move the ball to them and say, it's your turn score a touchdown for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so 
it's a really interesting conversation because I think that there is a level of high confidence that throws people off that aren't used to high confidence, uh, whether it's you're talking about something, whether it's you're producing something, whatever. And so that can often get misconstrued as, oh, my God, that guy's an egomaniac because he's just talking about blah, 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 whatever. But really, it's just it's just a confidence level of, you know, I feel good about what I'm saying. I feel good about what I'm showing you. I feel good about all of the bubble that we exist in. Um, and so when you um, when you talk about the ego and the egotistical part, I think there's an internal ego that you need to have for yourself, right? You need to have external confidence and internal ego, um, but you have to be able to control and kind of turn it on and off. It's all contextual. Um, you know, if you're stepping into a room, let's say you're going to go do a panel with Todd McFarlane, right? You need to have confidence for the, for the people watching you, but inside you need to turn the ego on because otherwise Todd is going to wipe you away off the, off the, off the table. He will take everything. But if you turn the ego on in that moment and you can sort of become the Hulk at that time, you can then stand next to Todd at this panel and and sort of fight for time because he's going to take the mic. You got to take the mic from him sometimes. So there's moments in time where it's valuable, but you know you got to learn when to turn it on and when to turn it off. Fair enough. Hold I, on, I just I just wanted to address the uh, <laughs> you know like J JD. Exactly. This is JD. I'm, I'm listen. Here we go. Right. I'm going to turn it on. Dick. JD. I'm here because this is a show about ego, and we all know. <laughs> that means it's me. <laughs> you know, and then he goes, oh, sure. They, because Jay, he, Jay has no ego. You know, he can't afford it. No. <laughs> um, yeah. And then, we, can, know, really? we, can, we can do a follow-up show on your show on Saturday, JD. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the thing is, though, is all the interesting shows really happen when he's not here. Um <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah. And it was oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Anyway. And then uh and then, and then look at this. Just, talk about no ego, very, very just soft. Just soft person. You know, weak, weak willed, just terrible. <clears throat> but yeah, I, I I agree with Tom. Uh and just everybody, what pretty much everyone said is it's one of these things. There's one thing I see is that yeah, there are, there do seem to be people who come out who seem to be, yes overly confident and sometimes it, it sometimes feels like they're overly confident in areas where you're just like yeah maybe you should chill a little mm -hmm. but you know i mean the thing is though is here's one thing is if they're putting their best work forward their best foot forward right go for it you know because you're going to need that ego we're in independent comic books and this chews people up like and spits them out like nothing you know yeah. i i mean think of i don't know how i've been doing it since 92 tom's been doing it for a minute the rest of you guys have been in for a minute think of all the people you no longer see all the guys who you've seen at shows and you might have seen them with that issue one possibly even an issue two mm -hmm. gone the next year for whatever reasons you know it could be family friends whatever it could be just something well, happened and, and even complete companies have disappeared yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. Not, not to even mention that yes yes you know, I could just just disappear for previews all together. Like, poof, just gone. <laughs> you know, a line of eight books gone. Right? I mean, after yeah. all the time. I think that, do you think that comes from them starting it over a want of making money rather than a want of creating good books? Yes. Or do you think they usually yeah, yes. have... And that's not to tear down the creators yes. that are there, but most right. of the time you see those publishers are there to take the product and then shuffle it down one more line to try and get Hollywood to take notice. Mm -hmm. Too many of them kind of seem to be IP farms to me versus yeah, no. like, let's make comics. Mm -hmm. Yep. Plus, like with, with indie comics, okay. especially if you're like myself, the writer, and you're paying the rest of the team, if your books, they, they can get very expensive pretty quickly. And if you mm -hmm. don't have the finances to sort of like keep that thing going, especially if anything, you know, happens like a medical issue or anything like that that just impacts it even further and i've seen a couple of people um that i've done kickstarters alongside with in terms of like they were doing one the same time i was doing one and i noticed one of them they said hey if we don't fund this then i'm not making any more of these books um 
me, I'm just too damn stubborn. I'm already too deep in the hole. Like these books, they're going to happen one way or another. Even if it kills me, I'm going to make these damn books. So, right. but like, that's the difference. Like I, I remember going out to dinner with a group of, they weren't indie people necessarily. They were a little bit like middle tier, I would say like between all the way big, like Marvel DC and not quite as, you know, low on the totem pole as I am. And I, you know, I said, oh, I'm staying. Uh, this was in Baltimore, actually, Sean. And uh, we were out to dinner and I, it's like 10 o'clock at night. I'm like, all right, well, I'm going back to my buddy's house. He's about 40 minutes out of town. They're like, why are you, why aren't you staying in a hotel? I was like, well, because hotels cost money. And <laughs> like I'm an indie person, I'm trying to save as much money as I can. And they're like, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I said, what do you do on your book? And he goes, everything. I said, okay. I My book cost me $22,500 <laughs> to make. And he goes, yeah, no, I'd, I would stay at my buddy's house too. I said, yeah. <laughs> like I do uh, Dragon Con every year, and I usually moderate a few panels on uh, indie comics. And to answer the other point that uh, Tom had said about uh, Todd, like talking and talking, part of that is also having a good moderator who could spin the plates mm -hmm. because – they have to take a breath at some point. And as soon as they go to breathe, they just, you just switch it to somebody else. <laughs> so that way other people can get in on the conversation. But one of the things I've heard numerous times from uh, indie creators who used to work for the big companies, and it's literally every year they say the same thing at these panels, which is if you're getting into this to make money, you've gotten into the wrong business. You do this for the love of the game. You do not get into it to strike it rich or something like that. It's just probably most likely not going to happen that way. I could say as a, how many artists I know David's an artist and then how many other artists are on here than just writers curious no no they're just just David okay I think Aaron and I are the only ones that actually write and draw our books draw, right yeah um coming as an artist it, it's it's funny what Tom is saying about the creative control and having the artists if you to me I'm like if you're not going to collaborate with the artists or give them some sort of creative endeavor inset into the book then we're just going to walk away um writers don't like to be treated as a pencil pusher artists don't like to be treated as pencil pushers either if we don't have any sort of creative input i mean it's like well i'm paying you just to draw stuff and i've seen so many people say that and then i watch the writers and usually the right the writing sucks or the writers are not artists and they don't know what they're talking about when you try to tell them what is wrong how to make the book better oh no i know what's good i know what's better and then you just basically watch a, a train wreck in slow motion that's that's what you watch i've seen this and i've i've dealt with i mean a lot of professional clients in tech industry and i just turn my brain off and do what they say and never give my input because they don't want it does this stuff look generic as hell yeah does it look like crap yes do they have any artistic talent no they don't they're not trained as artists. And so this is the thing is, is like when writers come in, and this was the writer ego, especially the person publishing the book, if you're not going to listen to the creative artists that you hire, then why hire them? Listen, we hire them because we want dance monkey dance. That's why. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, that's no, it. but that you, is, that's probably a spot on, spot on description. Yeah. We hire them start. because we've seen what they can do, <laughs> and we exactly. believe that it will translate to what it is that we're doing. There are a lot of artists out there that I won't hire because I don't believe what they do translates to what I do. So if right. I've hired you, if I've said, "Hey, dude, I like what you see, or I like what you do. I mm -hmm. want to see what you do with our stuff." Yeah. That's mm -hmm. why you're there. But you're not there to tell me how to redesign what's already there. You're not there to tell me how my story is being told. You're not there to tell me. Any of that kind of stuff. All you're there to tell me is, Tom, I hear your, I hear your uh, concept for this cover. What if instead of a back shot, it was this? Or if it was a different perspective or whatever. And in those situations, I go, oh, yeah, okay, you know what? I like that. Let's do that reverse angle that you thought about and let's do it. And I've talked to artists literally hundreds, if not thousands of times about those types of things. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if I like the idea... Then we go with it. I mean, mm -hmm. I, it's it's open. I've even told my storytellers, look, if you're if you're putting out a script or if you're drawing my script and and you see visually that there's a better way to move the characters through the panels, tell me and let's let's run through it. And mm -hmm. a handful of times I've been like, yeah, that makes sense. And other times it's like, no, I did it this way purposely. Yeah. Like the story beats 
are here for a purpose. But there have been times where I'm like, yeah, you know what? Yeah. That's right. Let's fix that. So absolutely collaboration is there. But at the end of the day, whoever is paying the bill gets the final say. And that's the only way that yeah. it can be. Because I guess if I, you, because if you as yeah. the artist insist on producing something that I don't like, I now have to take it and sell it in order to make my money. And if I don't think that I can sell it, then I lose, right? Because you've already been paid. Hey dude, here's 500 bucks. Thanks for the cover that I didn't want that I now have to try and sell that I didn't want. Now, if I pick wrong and I say, Hey dude, I need you to do this cover my way. And I pick wrong and I have to sell it and I lose, then it's on me. But it can never be, hey, artist, I'm going to go with you because you want to do it this way, even though I feel like it's wrong. Because if it doesn't sell, are you giving me a refund? Mm. Right. Right. But it shouldn't it be well. also on the artist to also sell the cover, too. In other words, it's weird to me to sometimes think that the writer is in charge of the team. If it's a collaborative effort, there should be no... Boss, okay, let's let's start say. there. First of all, collaborative effort would mean something like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's right. almost unheard of in the world of comics, right? There, that does happen, but it's almost unheard of. No, that's Most how manga is made. That has nothing to do with the car, with comics. Let's let's talk with comics, American comics. Because that's what we all do here, right? If you want to go into different business models and so on, there, are, like I just said, there are plenty yeah. of different business models, but in the world of comics. There is a right in, in the small guys, you know, we're not talking about Marvel and DC, mm -hmm. even though it's similar. There's a writer who has an idea. There's a writer who pays an artist. There's a writer who pays a colorist and a letterer. There's a writer who pays for the printing. And then there's a writer who has to sell the book at the end of the day. Now, the artists all the see get comps and so on. And you hope that the artist is happy with the work. And they're like, yo, I work for Tom and look at this thing. But that doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. Even that is a 50 50 bet because most of the time those artists will do something. They might give you a shout out. Hey, Tom's on Kickstarter. Go check it out. But now they're on to the next project. They're on to something for Zenoscope. They're on to something for Coffin Comics. They're, they've moved on. Whereas mm -hmm. we're still sitting on that same pile of comics that we still have to sell. So that is the model. That is the mold. Unless somebody is coming in and saying, hey, Aaron, why don't we create something together and we'll do this a little bit differently. But that is, uh, th that's not the, the norm in any capacity. Um, in fact, that's that's uh, that's such a huge outlier that we really haven't seen anything like it that has been effective since the Ninja Turtles in, in that sort of. So room. can I ask a question to just yeah. the writers in the room? So you don't have an artist uh, um, a team member that you would see as like a 50 50 partner in you have the stories and you hire the best writer for that specific book. Um, and it's well, I'm the in my case, I'm the writer, I'm, and I hire the artists, right? Yeah. I, in fact, I'll even sell, I'll even tell you this: I have offered uh, some of my artists a piece of the pie. I've said, mm -hmm. "Look, I I know you want to get paid a higher page rate. It's gonna be it's gonna be a bit of a struggle for me. What if instead I gave you a piece of ownership of whatever happens? Like I will literally will write up a contract. We'll create a piece of percentages for sales if it becomes a TV show or a whatever." We'll, we'll, we'll work that up versus work for hire. And every single time I have offered a piece of ownership, they've said, nah, I'll take the page rate. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I understand why I'm not putting them yeah. down. I understand why, because that's a guaranteed check. Mm. It was, right. If it's well, most, a most... page, it's a guaranteed check versus 75 a page and some percentage that may happen later. I mean, I totally understand it. I completely mm. get it. Right. Well, most of the guys I work with do everything. I have another friend who does his own book. He does everything. So most of the artists I know right. don't even work with writers. They just do it all themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, usually I find not to maybe this is my own personal ego speaking. I find the execution much more um, effective if it's done by just one person than as a team sometimes. Because uh, it's all coming from one person's head. And sometimes it doesn't translate at all, but sometimes it translates beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's definitely, I mean, you're talking about trying to combine writing with sequential art and the artist is a sequential storyteller. So basically I'm translating the script, the VO into illustrations. And I think sometimes some of that gets lost. And I think we have a lot of writers who think 
they know best. And most of the time I just give them the paper and pencil. I'm like, knock yourself out. Good luck. And uh, because it's a different language. It is it a is. different language. No the thing I mean, is, I've had to. Mo well, a lot of the stuff what I do professionally is taking corporate lingo for like banks and stuff and translating that in the pictures. It's the most abstract stuff you can think of translating the pictures. But it's also trained my brain to translate stories into pictures. And I do not think the model of writer artist collaboration team is the only model that is effective in American comics. In fact, this is no. something I've been thinking of a lot. I think I think there's a lot of different yeah, models yeah. and a lot of different avenues for making comics that can be explored. And I think the one thing that is wrong with American comics is we are too stuck with the past with wor what works. I don't think we are good at experimentation, which blows my yeah. mind considering if no one's making money but the thing is, in though, independent comics, then you should be experimenting more. But the thing is, though, that what you're talking about is you, you're excluding people like John Byrne, Dave Sim, uh, Mike mm -hmm. Mignola, uh, Walter Simonson. These are guys who are Frank Miller, right? Yeah. These are guys who would draw and illustrate ink, color. I mean, Byrne was yeah. infamous. He did everything on his damn book, oh, yeah, yeah. lettering, yeah. right? Uh, so, I mean, same thing with Dave Sim. He, he, he hired a guy, Gerhard, his partner. Well, the background artist, yeah. Right. Uh, but these are guys who did primarily all their work. Jeff Smith, Terry Moore. You know, there, there's tons of examples. Will Eisner is another one. Oh, yeah. Tons of examples of people who have done exactly what you're saying. So I don't think that's all exclusive. But the thing is, though, is like, you know, going with your case is where would, where would, be, we, where would we be without Watchmen? Right. Where would Alan Moore be? You know, we would lose all that work if we were just exclusive to just one or the other. Right. If it was just right, all yeah, artists just writing writers. all stories, you understand? And the thing right. is, is, um, you know, Alan is an artist, you understand? But he said he's nowhere near as fast enough to, to do that type of work. Bill Willingham is an artist, but he hired he, he got somebody else to draw fables because he says he, he couldn't do it. Right. No, I'm not. I, I think you misconstrued me. I wasn't actually talking about that idea, the exclusive model of saying different combinations of like, you know, you letter your stuff, JD. Yes. So like yes. finding writers that can letter. Like, in other words, instead of having somebody just letters, just colors or whatever, that you can combine different things, execute different levels of different, you know, disciplines oh, well. on different levels. That's what I was talking about. More. Oh, OK. I got you. I'm sorry. So yeah, like well, combining well. different different areas of expertise, like somebody you know, like, I don't know, like there's, you know, like um, Alex Ross is a painter. I always thought it was interesting yeah. when they hired painter, you know, uh, Dan Burrington is a painter. And painting comics, mm -hmm. I mean, that was fascinating to watch because nobody ever painted comics. And here's this guy that came in. So there's different disciplines, but I'm sure the way he's actually also, like, because I thought about as a line artist, I'm executing the way you view the page through line art, through line right. and stuff. But he's executing the way you view the page, follow the eye through light in color and shape it's a different discipline so i think the one thing especially when i see a lot of comics overseas is a lot of comics that um really experiment with different methods of producing the art photographs i did one did abstract watercolor really mm -hmm. interesting stuff that should be uh, sometimes i feel like i wish i'd see that more in america independent comics like let's attempt something we've never done before because you know if we're not making any money then what have you got to lose if you produce something beautiful yeah. i think sometimes yeah. a lot of independent artists get lost in trying to chase the dragon which is the standard american comic book style and um i guess industry the way things are done mm -hmm. and so it also depends on your your sort of vision for things because i mean you know it, i love watercolor stuff but i don't think watercolor would work for the style you know comic that i have or anything like that and uh, you know we were talking about uh, the writer artist relationship and i found just talking to other writers that everybody writes their books differently too like mine mm -hmm. when i'm doing um panel descriptions they're very very descriptive like time of day where's the camera what's the angle at the camera who's where what's going on you know as much detail as i possibly can and i know other writers who will literally just write a sentence and the sentence is this is what i want to have happen on the page you yeah. just make it you know happen um, mm -hmm. my artists, like every once in a while, as Tom had said, you know, sometimes, most of the time they just have it. However, I have it on the, you know, the panel and then other times they'll come back and like, Hey, you know, you did this. I think this will work better visually if you, if we do it this different way. And 
you know, if I think it's a better idea, sure, let's do it. And then sometimes they'll try it and I'll be like, nah, I, you know, I don't think it works as well. And I'll show it to a few other people too, just to, you know, be sure. Yeah. But like most of the time, then it's like, okay, then we just go back. But again, that's where that part of the collaboration comes in. But I mean, I understand what you're, you're saying about, you know, experimentation, but um, I just don't think that experimenting with might not necessarily work for the type of story that people are telling. And I've seen plenty of indie comics that have totally different styles. Like uh, there was a Kickstarter. I can't remember if it was my first or second Kickstarter that was going on simultaneously where he did a comic on like one of those folding out newspapers. Like as you unfold this little square, that is the comic. Yeah. 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 That sounds fast. So like, yeah, yeah, it was really, really cool. And I had never seen it before and it works for that, but I don't think that style works for like, yeah, every type of comic or anything like that. Oh, I no, think it's but more I mean, you just have to find what matches what you're going right. for. Yeah. Well, yeah. I remember like reading the, the artist team who did 30 days a night, that style mm -hmm. would never think for a horror comic, but it just clicked. And I think that was watercolor and some other, I think it was some mixed media, mm -hmm. but it was unique. I never seen anything like it. And I started seeing them. And so I sometimes, you know, I, I cause I've been thinking, you know, I see a, it feels like, and maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like a lot of people are chasing stuff that was created. Like there's a certain, we're not willing to budge from what's been done. And maybe that's part of what's defeating American comics when it comes to manga and other things overseas is, well, I don't you think know, when you're, when you're showing the kid the 30th superhero with the cape, they're like, no, I want to go with the guy with the chainsaw on his face. I've never sure. seen yeah. that. <laughs> but I mean, there, there's so. weird stuff like that in regular comics too. Yeah. I don't think it's chasing what's already been. I think it's, there's an understanding that the market the, that market exists, right? The, the the comic for the 24 page floppy with some covers that appeals to storytellers, excuse me, story appeals to readers, uh, appeals to artists, appeals to art collectors. That market exists. And so they try and tap into that market to some degree. But there's plenty of people that do comics in different formats, whether we, like what, what Darren was talking about, the weird fold out thing. I've seen mm -hmm. art of all kinds. I've seen watercolor. I've seen all yeah. kinds of stuff. I mean, it, there's there's no limit to what comics have been uh, or can be as far as your storytelling or your art. But those, let's say those success stories in those realms are few and far between versus what we see in sort of the quote unquote normal market. And I'm not saying superhero market. I'm just saying the standard yeah. 24 pages. Here's my my serialized story, often serialized. Um, and and. So I think that there, I think that there's a, this, the notion of there's a market that exists. Let me get my toes in it. And if you can get your toes in it and, and kind of stay there and sink in, then you have the opportunities to kind of do more experimentation because at that point, now you're kind of in there. Uh, you got people that kind of know who you are and know what you're doing. And you have kind of a fan base, hopefully kind of sort of starting to form around you. And then with that, and then you can kind of inform that fan base. Hey guys, we're going to do, like this weird uh, watercolor version or this, this other thing over here. Um, and then you have people that would hopefully, you know, sort of be like, yeah, Tom's doing something different. Let me, let me be a part of that versus coming into a space with something completely different, like the fold out thing and mm -hmm. sort of trying to create a market for it. There's, you know, does that make sense? I think that's what we're that's kind of what we're looking at. And there's definitely a lot of product that is, like you said, yeah, here's another person with a cape. A hundred percent that's a thing. Um, but that doesn't mean that those things can't succeed either. Look at Invincible now. Now it did it take 20 years? Yeah. But you know, now Invincible is on Amazon with a cartoon show and there's a live action TV show coming. So, you know, things that are genre and sort of I don't want to say cliche, but, you know, within what we already understand, derivative, um, they can still exist and they can still succeed. Um, I'm, Brian Polito is a perfect example. I mean, yeah. he's got a character that's now 30 years old that he's clearly making money on. Um, so it's not that there's no money to be made in comics. It's that there are people making money, but it's not that, that we're not all Brian Polito. Right. Yeah. That's that's. And I think that that's kind of where it gets lost in the in, in the discussion is yes you can make money making comics yes you can um but we're all not going to be brian polito yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is is as writers there are experiments that we can do for ourselves one of the experiments i've done with oswald is 
Well, how many different genres can I get them involved in? Can I can I do yeah. a horror story? Can I do a science fiction story? Can I do portal adventures? Can I do a fantasy? So on and so forth. Also, uh, I I have um, this one insane story that I'm still working on, where it's um, Oswald. He's in dream. He walks into a bar and he finds sitting at the table at a table, H.P. Lovecraft, Bram Stoker, Mary Shelley. Um, there's like two or three other writers. I forget the names. But all of these famous classic writers. And he sits down and he has a beer with them. And each of them tell a story. My job as a writer is to tell a story in the voices of each of those writers. Okay? That's a oh, huge that's challenge. Fun. Yeah, that would right, be that's interesting. Huge, yeah. Right. That's a huge challenge for me as a writer. Right? Now, I'm going to try, when I actually get him illustrated, I'm going to try to match each each writer or each story with a different artist right but you know that that's like crazy me like being like okay i want to experiment you understand and not yeah. every writer wants to take that sort of thing on because uh, let me tell you like i got to go back and i got to reread frankenstein and or i have to go read uh layer of the white worm on top of reading uh, you know dracula and i have to go read these various stories from these various writers to try to pick up on their writing ticks and cues so i can incorporate that into the tales that they're telling Right. So it's not easy. You understand? So, I mean, but it's an experiment. You understand? Yeah. And that's a challenge for me as a writer. But like not everybody likes to take those sorts of things on. Um, all right. Look, we beat this one to death. Tom, it's your turn. What's your question? Oh, geez. I, OK. Uh, <laughs> that was so only the I, first question. Yeah. Oh that was my the God. First, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> so said I, a little my, bit more here then. <laughs> yeah, my, my question is actually a little lighter uh, than JD's. I, I just because I've I've had these kind of moments happen to me in, in my creating uh, space and time. Is I'm kind of curious um, if you guys have any weird sort of uh, mental gymnastics or or moments in time where, as you were creating something, whether you're creating a story or creating a particular character or whatever, something uh, uh, unique that helped you push that particular thing forward. Um, cause like I've talked sometimes on panels where uh, people talk about where inspiration comes from. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I've said that inspiration is everywhere. Like you could walk to the bank and something could happen and, and it can inspire you for a character, a story, a thought process, whatever. So I'm just curious if you guys have had any sort of like outside the box experiences that drove a character or a story for you. Right, yeah. Cool. I've yeah. had that with two of them <laughs> actually two uh, two separate books that i did where the one that's on kickstarter right now while i was writing it all uh not last year but the year before that uh i was in a very dark place because uh, there was some like uh, some relationship stuff going on and that part of the story i had written that part years prior but actually sitting down and writing out the script in detail like it gets really really dark to the point where the editor was just like man this is heavy. And I was like, yeah, I was in the right, wrong kind of headspace to make this like, to just really lean in on this point. And then when I was writing the fourth book, that one's all about um, basically, you know, being able to forgive yourself. And again, I was going through some stuff last year and I didn't even realize when I had written it that basically I was talking about myself in the book. Like I was the main character for a little bit. And then after I had written it, I was just like, ah, crap. I literally wrote this about myself, but I mean, it works in the story. Like it works for what the story is. It's just sort of like my life experiences had sort of shaped what was also going on with the character and how the writing was sort of encircling that character. So, yeah, so I've had that a couple of times. Uh, not the happiest of instances, but then again, my book series isn't really a happy go lucky story. So, I mean, it kind of works. All right, cool. Uh, Sean, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, so like the entire idea of my my first story or, or the fog within in general was I was on a run and I was running through some fog and I thought what if I went past this fog and I was in the future and that's how I came up with the entire original plot and um, just when I was writing the the entire thing um, I, I was just thinking oh this would be a cool idea oh this would be a shocking moment and this and that. And I was like, after I actually uh, wrote it out, I was like, Oh crap, that actually happened to me, you know, in my life with uh, being married for a while and having kids and, you know, this happened or this happened. So I didn't even realize it 
when I was writing it, but yeah, I was writing part of my story that's already happened just in a, a sci-fi way, not a everyday normal way. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Uh, David, what are you thinking? Yeah, it happens to me all the time. Uh, <laughs> so I'm an elementary school art teacher and I was walking around where I'd gotten the kids started on their thing. They were doing the thing that they were doing. I'm just walking around talking to the kids saying, hey, try this, Mr. Whale, and I have a cat, great, whatever the kids are talking about and doing. And as I'm walking around, I look out the window and the thought just popped in my brain, what if what if aliens were to attack right now? How would I get these kids out of here? What, what would I try to do to keep these kids safe? And this happened probably about nine o'clock in the morning. And I'd say by the time I left school, I had the whole thing plotted out and probably the first five or six pages already thumbnailed. <laughs> um, so it just it happened like super quick and super organic of me thinking how, and then taking some of the kids' personalities and some of the things, if you if you read uh, that one shot, will aliens do my homework? Uh, if you're a teacher, you'll you'll laugh your butt off because it is 100% the teaching experience. It just happens to be with aliens attacking, because <laughs> these kids are just yelling out some things. You're like, where? Why? How, where did that come from? Why are you yelling this out? And it all stemmed from just just that one experience of walking around and popping in my brain uh, for something like late in light speed. Uh, about three years ago, my, uh, we went to, I have a big family and we do vacations at Outer Banks and my, uh, little brother, I say little brother, but he's 40. Uh, he has a son who's about <laughs> seven, six, seven years old. And he, uh, to say he's a spitfire is being, uh, being kind of with the words. He is a kid who is jumping off the walls 24 hours a day. Great kid, funny kid, but just just nothing but energy. And I'm sitting by the pool with my brother on one side, my uh, brother-in-law on the other side who also loves comics. And I say and I look at my brother, I say that kid's a, that kid's a comic book character. I need to get that kid in a, in a book somewhere. And uh, within and my brother-in-law like, "Yeah, let's what, what do you, how would you do it? What would you do?" cuz he really loves comic books also. And so we just started like muddling around this and muddle around that. And I had some other ideas for some sci-fi stuff. And within a half an hour, I, I got up. I, I'm like, I got to go write this stuff down. And I went up and wrote it all down, came back down and told, looked at my brother and say, you all right with me putting this kid in a book? And he goes, he goes, yeah, that'd be awesome. And he does that weird look like, you're weird, man. Where did this stuff come from? Why, how did you come up with all this stuff in, in half an hour? Um, yeah, but that kind of stuff happens to me all the time. I love it. All right, cool. Aaron? I, I get inspiration from, it's fun. Jay asked me what experimentations I've, I've done in my books. I can, maybe that's the best way to answer this question. Maybe I can combine the two. Um, mm -hmm. I did, I started, everyone kept telling me to do children's books. And I remember I finally, like, well, what if I could write an adult story in a children's book format? What would that look like? Like not a book, not a story for kids, a story for adults. And so I did. It was it was an old West book called Dead Luck, and I still um, uh, I have it uh, formatted. I did get a published. I need to look and get it published because it's a different physical format. But it was sixty pages, and I did it. But it's fun because I actually got to play with the writing style in the book because since it was all written like prose and the pictures, I could practice sequential like splash pages with the tempo of the writing because it was all Western. So I wrote it in a sort of prose sort of thing. And uh, so that was one experiment. I wrote two kids' books. One of my kids' books was about an alien wildlife photographer, and that one was published. And instead of writing a story, I wrote it like a, a field guide. Like he actually got out to the planet and and photographed all these aliens and basically created these field guides, this field, whole entire field guide. So the whole book tells a story, and it's more about kids looking at. It. And so one page is. The, the what he's photographing the other page is his notes and I actually drew in uh, uh, like scotch tape so the photos of scotch tape to the page it looks like it's handwritten so it's a field guide um and then you know the second one i wanted to do a wildlife fantasy tour that's my second kid's book the girl was a a fantasy tour and i'm like well, what if i could write a book with those travel brochures you see the travel brochures like come here go there well, what mm -hmm. if that was a book it's about a fantasy world how would we do that and so i created this little goblin uh lady that's the miranda um fantasy land tour guide and she took this family on a tour of this fantasy land and each page is a two-page spread in the kids book and the idea was to have less words more visual so instead of going more wordy i took 
less words is probably like a sentence or two per page. And the idea was I wanted you to look at the picture. So I'm trying to tell the story through the visual medium alone. And I would hide, I'd hit like animals. In fact, there's one character is hidden in every page. That's a secret I built into the book. And you, you I don't tell you, you have to figure it out for yourself. Um, <laughs> since I told you I'm here, right? So that was an experimentation of basically writing the story as a travel brochure of a fantasy land written in the story. Um, that was one experiment. Uh, Goblins was more of a story experiment. And I know JD's read my Goblins where mm -hmm. I get to the about halfway through and I flip everything on its head. And so the idea was to, instead of writing about a character who's out to get revenge, I wrote about a character who made a mistake and somebody's trying to get revenge against him. So it was from his point of view. And it was also about loss and some other things I was going through. And that was my 300 page book that I finished. Um, my new book is me trying to experiment with getting rid of the sequential format. So each page of my knocked book, which is the one you'll probably show tonight, is a page, is a story, every issue is a complete story. And the idea is to, it's for kids or middle school, high school, or young adults, to hand it out to anyone and they get a complete story. And it, there's some lore that interconnects, like a television show. I mean, you can watch any episode of Knight Rider. But there's some there's certain lore that connects through each episode. As you more you watch it, more you pick it up. So same sort of concept. Can you do that in a kid's book? That way, if somebody sees one of my copies on a shelf and say it was like issue three, because I don't number them, that they'll pick it up. Oh, I don't know what this is. So I'm trying to figure out a way. And I'm also going to like Robert E. Howard or like Lovecraft. Could you write complete short stories in a, in a book? In other words, splitting the comic into multiple issues instead of a graphic novel, can you write it in the individual issues? So I'm, I'm just attempting uh, that. So most of my experimentation comes from what if we can mix formats? What if we can do stuff? My The kid's book that was the um, Did Luck, the uh, cowboy one, I showed that to Jim Valentino, and I remember he really liked it. And he sat there and thought, and his, he literally, what he said, I wouldn't know how to market this. He's like, but I would buy it if I saw it like that. And so I was like, cool. Okay. So I think there are ways to do interesting ideas. And I'm always experimenting with different ways. Uh, I try not to make any of my projects are not identical. There's always some shift or some idea that I'm trying to push or do. I, I got a degree in fine arts. And so that pushed my experimentation of being an artist into the commercial field. And I like to experiment with formats that people find commercially viable, books and books, books, but can you mix and can you make new things? I think you can, I think you do some really fascinating things and things people have never seen or done before. And I guess to me, like, like I said, independent comics, there's not much money to be made. This is the perfect opportunity to do this stuff. And so that's just me, what I personally been doing. So yeah, not even my kids, and I've had, you know, the Miranda one, uh, there's not much of a story here. And I'm like, yeah, that wasn't meant to be much of a story. That wasn't the concept of the book. My ex some experiments work, some fail. But I feel like if I'm not trying to do something new, at least with the story or the format of the book, I just get bored with it. I don't feel it can make anything new. And I want to try to inv invigorate other artists to take chances and not just with the art, but with the far different things you can never. And Godlians, you've read Godlians. I have a degree in philosophy. I have a minor in philosophy. Could I talk about philosophy in a comic book? Straight up philosophy, not dumbed down. And so I attempted it and did it. Because mm -hmm. I looked up and researched, could I, and I've never seen a comic book talk about philosophy. And so I thought about fate versus free will. And uh, I when I, I had some people read it and they got it. So I was always like, they're going to get it because I could get kind of abstract. And they got it and no. So, yeah, I have stuff that comes from all over the place. All right, cool. Peter, what are your thoughts? Um, not not entirely sure where the where all the ideas come from. I'm kind of glad they do. And uh, <laughs> my process is like you know old school. I have a, you know like I write it all down. Mm -hmm. And just make scribbles and notes, and then, you know, like I have one of you know this, and I, you know, look like some serial killer's freaking back wall, right? You know, <laughs> where 
lines going everywhere to different ideas and not entirely sure where they come from most of the time and glad they're glad they do and and um like it's interesting that you know when i first the first comic book writing gig i i got was with antarctic press and it was superhero and you know but now and and you know i i did quite well with that but now everything i i write is is horror and and horror is the genre that i don't really care much for i never really read it um you know like i i, I, don't, I don't watch it you know i I, ne I don't even know if i've ever read a horror book i i've talked to people and they'd say oh yeah well i you know they mentioned some horror movie that they seen and they'd ask me if i'd seen it i'd say no they'd say well geez you you know you you write it why don't you know you, you'd think you'd watch it and i'm like no not not really you know i'm i'm more old school superhero that i read you know like i'm reading batman and like ram v's batman and stuff like that and um like i just like sandy crothers um j just contacted me there last week he said men in black fame and he's got an anthology that he's going to be doing uh called uh, D dark shores and he wanted me to write a story for it and and so i said i would like a, and like interestingly enough the 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 story and i imagine you guys can all relate to this the story i originally wrote was not the one that i sent him because by the time i got to the end it i pulled george R. R. martin and had to redo the entire thing because i i i got reading through it and i thought i, I wonder if i just changed this part of it instead of it being like the the phantom shipyard I'm going to make it this marrow ship Leviathan, which is this old dead whale monster with a ship stuck inside of it that the people have to go into the, you know, they got to go into through the tongue of the whale and they find this Lord of the Rings type door there that they have to go through. And that was never, ever part of the story. Right. But I just just kind of popped in my head. So I had to go back and rewrite the entire thing which and you know something which is interesting it flowed better once i did that I, I find that if like if it doesn't tend to flow out then maybe i'm going in the wrong direction like you know the stories seem to take on a, a life of their own you know um like and one of the things that i try to do now is know what the ending is before i really start the beginning because i've been i've had that happen where you you know you want to do a four issue arc and you know it turn, turns out to be eight and and it should only be four so you have to you know or you're trying to figure out how to you know to to write you know eight pay eight comics in four issues right and so now i know mostly when i when i do arcs now i know what the i know how it's going to end and then i work backwards and i try to keep like the core things you know that i want i want in in the story to actually be in the story that there's always always room for change like i said with the story that i wrote for the that anthology that i just sent away yesterday was you know um the artist is gonna have a fun time with this but you know i i i you know i wrote the entire thing and turned around like i said i got an idea changed and then i had to rewrite rewrite it again but i enjoy doing it when, when it feels like work I, I i tend not to like it very much but i you know i knew i was going in the right direction because it, it didn't feel like work and the time just kind of and and i couldn't wait to get back to it to revise and you know and edit and all that stuff so i i know when that's happening that i'm going in the right direction and and i know that when i send send it to the artist and they're not sending me back a lot of question marks and what are you talking about and you know then i i also know that i'm going in the right direction all right cool <clears throat> um it's just something called the muse didn't they were like stephen pressfield i think this guy's name and he wrote a book called the art of creativity or something and he said that if you go and write or draw or do anything the same time every day whether you want to do it or not that you're going to tap into some universal force or something you know and i i think you know there i think there's something to that mm -hmm. no uh, definitely 
for some reason for me it's three in the morning <laughs> um but yeah I, 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 I you know I, I think uh for me it was uh, the first Oswald story I ever wrote it's like uh, I took it as a challenge um this whole story Daphne hates hearing it because I blame her for it um we were walking and we just saw this patch of uh flowers and one of them was chewed up and I was like oh you know, it looks like some fairy is going to be mad. Some some troll chewed up her, uh, her her patch. And she looked at me and she was like, that's ridiculous. And I was like, no, it's not. That's a good story. And that was the first Oswald story I ever wrote. It was called The Park Avenue Mall War. And, um, and then it just blossomed from there, right? It just, you know, just spun out from there. So, yeah. So, yeah, it definitely happens for me all the time. So, Tom, ask your own question. Uh, yeah, it's happened a bunch of times for me. Um in various stages of my life, which, uh, which have been interesting. Some of it fun, some of it, uh, not so fun. Um, but, um, the, the, one of the, one of the keys was just, uh, like, like I talked about inspiration is everywhere. So I remember, um, I do a lot of, watch a lot of stuff on just like space and UFOs and just whatever, all that kind of nonsense. And, um, for whatever reason I was watching some of these shows and, uh, they were, they kept saying, uh, they just kept saying Ursa, major and minor like back and forth there's a major there's a minor there's a major, major and in my brain my brain just started processing what that meant little bear big bear whatever uh and i was like yeah but i you know within the comic sense within the story sense i knew that there's already been like ursa major in other places but like what would we do with ursa minor what would the little bear mean um and so that's where suddenly i was developing this uh this this weird um were bear story with this little blonde girl who turned into a giant, you know, super giant, um, were bear monster. Um, so that was a really simple one. And then, uh, you know, a number of years ago, um, I wanted to finally do a kaiju book because I'm a huge Godzilla fan. And this would have been like, I don't know, six or six years or so into my career. And I, I've never did anything with kaiju before. And I just started kind of tinkering with it, but I didn't know how to, I didn't know what the, what the framework of it was like, yeah, we can just write a movie where the monsters come and run into each other. But um, is there a framework that I could put around this uh, to, to, to make it mean a little bit more. And um, at the time I was going through a really bad time with my divorce and just, it was just horrendous. Uh, And so I was also at that time doing uh, research on things like the five stages of grief and, um, you know, denial and, and anger and bargaining and all that kind of stuff. And so as I was doing that, I was writing the Kaiju book at the same time. And I started to realize that I could create a world and stories that took us through essentially the five stages of grief. Um, so it would be sort of cathartic internally but it would also be sort of like the five stages of grief for the entire planet as the planet is destroyed, you know, by the monsters with these characters, how do they respond to, uh, to, to all of these things. And I took it to my editor, uh, Carrie Caster. I was like, you, you like monster stuff. Like you're, you're like me, you like Godzilla stuff. This is my thought. Um, what, what, what do you think? And she was like, that's, that's really cool. And so I, we actually uh, tag teamed the book. And so it ended up being a 40 page book where she wrote one story that um, was, we just started at the beginning. So it's denial. She wrote a story. I wrote a story and it was about the entire world coming apart, but in different locations. So we got completely different experiences from the, from the human characters that all had to start dealing with their denial. And then of course we'll move on to anger in the next story and see how all these characters evolve through, you know, all the way through to acceptance that essentially well, the world is gone, guys. Because uh, you know that's what happens in kaiju movies. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's it's generally it's generally no go uh, by the end. So um, I've had a lot of those types of odds and ends of things happen uh, in my life, and um, I I you know it's 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 like whenever I do these these no, not these panels, but even when I do panels at Comic Cons, and people invariably ask me where do you get the inspiration for this stuff, and I'm like, man. I mean, it can come from anywhere at any time. Uh, I mean, you people in the audience might pick up on something that we say and go racing out to your car and start writing down in a notebook. Uh, who knows? Who knows? Because, I mean, stories are endless. You know, there's no limitation. So anywhere, anytime, that's the story and that's the inspiration, too. So, um, yeah, that was, you guys had, had good answers. I like that. 
and I guess uh, I guess we lost JD. I think I he's know probably he's had some Daphne's computer. Okay, he's going to switch over. Yeah, he's last week he had some internet that. problems too, uh, but he got it figured out. And uh, I think we're we're just about to show y'all's uh, campaigns here. Do we have how many so people Tom, have campaigns? I see three. Back Tom, here. I'm going to need you to tell me where to get this kaiju book of yours if you can. Oh sure, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, um, Bigdogin.com. Well, sure. Let's let's just do it. <laughs> let's just chill for a minute, guys. Um, if you guys want Big Dog Inc. books, uh, most of what we do starts on Kickstarter rolls through um, our web store, eBay, Comic-Cons, etc. We are now being published by uh, Antarctic Press. They're actually nice. reprinting all of our old books now, uh, starting with Critter. Well, I shouldn't say all of them, but they're reprinting Critter right now, uh, which is actually in stores. But if you guys want back issues or trade paperbacks or any of that kind of stuff, um, BigDogInc.com is, uh, you just go right to our web store. And like I was saying earlier, um, we won't have a link to show you guys anything tonight, but uh, we'll be launching a, a crowdfunding uh, Kickstarter for Critter number 23 uh, this Saturday. So um, that's that's where you can get all of my stuff. And then I'm going to be at a ton of conventions uh, starting in May too. So we'll, now JD's back. So we'll, we'll talk about all that Sorry. stuff towards the end. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that, guys. My, my computer is being temperamental. Uh, no worries. Should I, should I start my answer over? I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. I'm putting, I'm pulling up Peter something. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter, what do we got here, man? You're you're in uh you're in previews. Talk to me. Oh, that's uh, uh, in in May in the May previews. I um, deliver some Evil One premieres, and uh, it's drawn by Mattia Doggini. And you know, um, it's it it they they were generous enough to you know put us in the spotlight for 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 that month and then i have another one uh harvest of horrors three that also made the spotlight of the month for the month of may and that's with that's with caliber um the deliver us from evil title is is coming out monthly starting in may you know um there there's previews link for for issue two issue one it's where i think we're past the the ordering part for that now and then in um um halloween i have another title coming out uh, it's going to be a monthly title called mud madness uh T tales of the great war but it's not it's not just going to be horror stories from world war one but it's going to it's going to be more of a like a like a weird world or a weird war type thing the first um five issues are already complete and they're 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 basically World War One horror stories with, you know, it's mo mostly World War One, um, like, you know, history with it with a supernatural twist to it, you know, and and uh, the Deliver Us from Evil story, basically is you know it's uh, to my homage to X Files and. Constant John Constantine and, and all, all the stuff like that. It's a it's a big mixture of those. All right, cool. And both of these are available in the current previews. The the harvest of horrors is uh in in it would have been in, those are the comics that Harvest of Horrors comes out in May. It's already available on Amazon and and in, in like Barnes and Nobles and 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 um uh walmart places like that uh it, it comes out to the stores comic book stores in may and then deliver us from evil one comes out to the com comic book stores in may and so but like i think they're past the deadline now to order those so i think that like number two comes out mm -hmm. in june so i think now comic book stores are placing orders for for june comics all right, cool. Like I said, I, I don't know I, how I that had, works. I just, I just yeah, write. I picked up. Yeah, I got you. I picked up the latest previews and I saw your name in it. And I know one of your books is in there. If those are trade paperbacks, they are probably available for back order. Generally, a, a company will keep the previous issues open so that uh, if people missed it, they can they can back order. Well, the, cal them, so. the caliber ones are. Yeah, you can get like yeah. Harvest of Horrors one three through Caliber, and you can get the Mississippi Zombie ones through Caliber. They're all available on Amazon too, but the Deliver Us from Evil title and the Mud Madness titles, those are 
there's the only way you're going to get those you got to order them through stores right you know and oh, okay is there there, gotcha. there is no back issues to to get right right all right cool or at least not well, yet not, there isn't. now we got a fog going on um you know sean do you want me to play this video Ah, uh, you can it's semi-basic <laughs> All right, cool. Just give me a second. I just want to check something. Nice and short. I like it. Thank you. Tell me nice. about five hours to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's how that will work. I know that's, how, that's how it always goes. <laughs> oh, yep. yeah. Uh, so, so basically, the idea of the fog within in the first issue was there's a catastrophic event in the present. Um, there's an infection from this event. The government doesn't know what's going on. Uh, they wall in uh, this town of Brooks and um, they had to fend for themselves. This regime comes into place and really about three days after the event happens and some of this government stuff starts to unfold, um, a hunter is on a run and uh, he runs through this fog and that ends up 26 years in the future where this regime of, uh, of government is taking over, taking all the resources from the civilians. There's uh, rebels involved um, trying to take it back to the people. And um, there's a prophecy involved that happened during the infection and, and the chaos. And uh, they know that this savior is coming from this fog. So the rebels are ready to, to save him at the beginning. And uh, he doesn't know what's going on. They think he does. And he's learning about his ability. And you have some really cool elite rebel uh, type characters um, that, uh, that definitely know who they are. And uh, so there's a lot of Hunter learning about himself, and then also rebels that know what they're doing and, and fighting the uh, the regime of schism is what they're called. Um, Did you say so? Number schism? two, huh? Schism. Oh, schism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> A little better name than yeah. Um, so there's also um, these soldiers that work for uh, schism. They're called the Swarm. Uh, it's kind of like a hive mind um, type. Uh, soldier group and uh, the, the elite rebels, uh, they're Alpha, uh, Zeta, uh, Epsilon. They all have code names. Um, they, uh, they have, of course, their, their, uh, their best qualities um, that they bring to the table can take out these guys pretty easily. And this issue uh, with I show in covered uh, B and cover C, uh, there's these monsters that, uh, they come into play that um, they can't take on so easily. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's uh, kind of like a 90s nostalgic um, kind of action-packed stories. Um, I've been saying the elevator pitch is it's like Bad Batch or G.I. Joe meets X-Men in the apocalypse with the time-traveling fog. It's been my elevator pitch. Nice. So this is issue two of how many issues? So right now, the first arc is what I'm focusing on. So it'll be uh, four issues for the first arc. I've already written out completely those. Um, and I would like to get to the entire story, which is going to be 12 issues. But right now, since I'm just getting started, I'm trying to make sure I, I have small goals and then reach the, the large goals. 
right, cool. Nice. Yep. Now, what type of um, schedule are you looking at? You're looking at a every quarter releasing a book, every twice a year, that sort of thing. What are you looking at? Yeah, so last year for the first issue, because um, I wrote it last year, I found my team. We did the Kickstarter, and I was just learning day by day. It took me pretty much the entire year. It was really nine months. Um, and mm-hmm. then I got the book out and um, sent it to everybody in December. So now that I know more of an idea of what actually to do and all the steps involved, uh, I'm trying to do at least two books a year. So right now, um, this one's almost completely done. Uh, I have the last couple of colored pages and, uh, and lettered pages to finish. By the time the Kickstarter is over, um, I'll be going to, to print and then sending it out to everybody. Um, and my plan is for issue three to come out around August, September on Kickstarter and be almost completely done by the time I go to Kickstarter again. So then next year I'll finish the, um, the, the fourth issue at the beginning of the year and then hopefully have the trade by the, uh, the end of the, or mid mid year next year. So I can continue on with that. Yeah. So the second cover is uh, uh, Gilliard, uh, is it Gilliard Goulart, something like that. It, it's on there. That so, um, yeah, yeah, Gilliard Goulart. Yeah, he's yeah, done some stuff for Travis Gibbs, and I saw his stuff, and I just had to use him. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's cool. I really like Thank that you. one. That stood right out. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. the monster. Funny thing with that is, um, I was going between uh, two covers at the end uh right before i was gonna go live and i had all these podcasts set up so i had to be ready but i also wanted to finish products so i had two different artists doing two different covers that could work for issue two or three and uh, he finished that i didn't think it'd be done but he finished um he did the pencils and the inks uh like two days before i was going live and i had a colorist that works for mad cave um do the uh the colors and the, the colors did it in one day so it was done before yeah. the one I thought was going to be done. So I was like, I have to put it on here now. And it, it gives me vibes of like uh, Hellboy or um, the inspiration for the, what they call is the pets. There's two of those guys. Um, it's more like a pit and Hulk kind of mix, but mm-hmm. also like a fog power vibe as well. So, so does the guy out. breathe the fog? Does, does that his power breathing in the fog? Like does he yeah, exhale that, it out? Like breathe it out. Yeah, exactly. It's, okay, it's internal for him. So the fog. There's a couple of guys with with fog type abilities. Um, I don't really um, go into detail of how he uses it, uh, but it is internal with him. I would say that. You know, it's funny. It reminds me of one of my uh, favorite scenes from that old Transformer animated movie, where one of them gets shot like in a spaceship, and then like all this fog of steam comes out of his mouth as he dies. <laughs> the way they drew it, it was really cool. I don't know. I don't know. Remember, maybe I'm, I'm aging myself here. And uh, but yeah, when I saw it, I was like, you reminded me of that that scene. And I mean, of course, as a kid seeing that, you're like, I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> like, uh, that's actually was, was that, that was that jazz? I think it was the prowl. Like the, I think it was like the, there was one. There was like jazz was, and then there was prowl. That was like the cop car. Right, I think it was right. him. He, he turned around in his chair and got mm-hmm. shot. Then all the smoke, and I just—that's what it reminded me of. I, mean, I always thought that was a cool scene in the movie. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, all right. So Sean, I mean, you got another twelve days ago, you sixteen hundred. So you're sixty-four percent there. I mean, you got a little work to do, but I think you can make it. So. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, it's looking good, man. Very Appreciate nice. It. Very nice. All right. Cool. All right. Let's. Hold on. All right. Now we're going to go with the knot. Oh, so my, what do we my, got my, here? This is, I guess, the second story of Knot. And um, he's basically in this story, he ends up trying to kill a pumpkin. I think if you go down, you can see like one of the first pages. He's You can click on those pages and they come up. He that's um him falling off the cliff, the embarrassing barbarian moment. Um, but yeah, he's trying to hunt this this pumpkin and he kills it, and this dog comes out and takes his axe and his pumpkin. He's like, What the hell? And goes chasing off, and that's when he comes across 
starts tracking it down. And then I think I put the two page spread where he comes across, uh, comes across a Jekyll and Hyde. So Jekyll and Hyde, what I did is I took Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde and made a two headed monster. One side's Hyde, one side's Jekyll. And so he just ends up getting his food back. But it, I just, in the book, he, he, you know, kills it. And as she's about to get the kill, this dog comes out of nowhere and she has a pink bow in her hair. Her name is Trixie and grabs this meal and takes off. And it's like, what the hell? So I'm trying to do more like pulp type stories, uh, right. just like little incidents. My first story of Knocked um, was he encounters a talking skull who's trying to roll its way to a graveyard to get together with his love, his long lost love. And he helps the skull get to the graveyard in exchange for food, but it doesn't go the way he wants. That's the first story. That's that one. That's the one where he's fighting zombies. That's, I think, in his, he's in the forest of, like, soul and blood, or, like, trees that devour souls, and that's when he's, like, eating one of the branches and this blood coming out and souls coming out. And anybody who played Gauntlet probably knows that reference. Um, so he's, you know, taking the little talking skull to the graveyard, and he ends up, I don't want to give away too much of the story, but he ends up kind of getting caught up in a love story and tries to help his way out, but it doesn't work out it's very heavily inspired by like you know uh conan and stuff I, I i like barbarians i like halloween so i mixed halloween with barbarians and then that's the miranda book i told you about and the roscoe my godlings the right yeah the miranda one is done in, uh full so those are like huge <clears throat> full page spreads of my kids book and each each page is its own place one on the tour and so cool. that that's one and then the other one uh roscoe's the one i get stopped with all the time that's the one so each page is that's him as a photograph and they do the page before it. that's his actual notes so the whole book is set up like notes or whatever and uh these two were published by action lab which was if everybody knows action lab that was that story but i still have them i like to do more with this character um yeah so and then, did they like, actually did they actually print it yeah, they printed it, but I can't get a hold of them, so I don't know how to get the. There's thousands, a few thousand copies of my book sitting at Diamond, I guess, but I have no, I don't know how to get in contact with Diamond to get the books to me. So I'm, I've been cut off. So I got to figure out a way to reprint the book. Which have is kind you of a spoken? Bummer. Have you spoken to um, Action Lab about it? They won't return my emails. The emails I I sent or try to connect, they say it doesn't exist anymore. So they completely cut it off. Yeah, that's some um, like that's a three hundred page. But you have all uh, the files for the book, right? Oh yeah, it's all mine. Yeah, just take it to crowdfunding. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought about doing that. This is the the, the my first Kickstarter will be for this book, my okay, Goblin's cool. book, um, which I'm starting out with a three hundred page graphic novel. So uh, give me a prop there. I'm I split it into twelve issues. I'm also going to offer the issues, so you can either buy the issues or the graphic novel. And I have some. Uh, prints that I'm doing that has some people do some uh, artwork for prints. I'm not doing alternate covers just because the, the books are, are done or whatever. So I'm putting prints in instead of the alternate covers and stuff. And that was the one that, that that's the one that has philosophy in it and stuff, fate versus free will and stuff like that. And uh, so, yeah. Hmm. So, and then you can buy all the individual issues for that. If you want to try it out on my site too, all 12 of them, or you can just buy the whole thing. It was meant to be one huge book. But I split it into issues just so I can actually just dis- start to disseminate it into the world. So it wasn't like the thing with the issues is the covers are only on the issues. I don't reprint the covers in the book. So if you want the 12 covers, you have to buy the issues. Um, so that's that. So I kind of make it unique to that. Like, you know, if you want the covers, buy the issues. If you don't care about the covers, just want the story, buy the book. Uh, it costs about 60 to buy the whole 12 issue series, the five, five a piece. Or forty for the book, so the graphic novel's forty. That seemed to be the sweet spot that I've seen graphic novels go for. So, cool. yeah. Now, uh, go ahead. Uh, so you got Knock Two out now. How uh, how long ago did you release Knock Two? Knock Two was released. Um, I just printed it. I think the be- la- middle of last month. I only print twenty five copies. Oh, okay. So yeah. I just twenty five, and I throw them in if I need more. It costs about a hundred bucks. Uh, yeah. through uh, mm-hmm. Comics Well Spring. So I just print 25 and throw them in. So people want to order them, they can in any order. Mm-hmm. I am coming the halfway mark through the third 
issue where he faces vampires and ghost ghost dogs. And then his fourth issue, I think yeah, he's going to meet his main nemesis, which is the basically a headless headless horseman variant, who mm-hmm. basically his little army of people, he doesn't he doesn't like heads, so he goes around and chops off people's heads and places it with pumpkins because he thinks it looks better. So I'm I'm taking very Halloween tropes mm-hmm. and trying to flip them around on their head and stuff. Knocked himself has a history, and I'll, I I have some stories going into a little more history of who he is and a little bit where he came from. But it's I just I, I always liked Robert E. Howard stories where it was just a straightforward tale of Conan. I mean, all you need to know he was a barbarian, you didn't know anything else. And it was just something cool. I kind of miss stories like that. The old Judge Dredd used to do that. I mean, you'd read old, any Judge Dredd story, as long as you knew he was a judge and what he did, it just, so I don't know. So I'm trying to maybe bring that back a little ways in this story. Nox stands for Nocturnal. That was where I got that name from. So, gotcha. yeah. Listen, it looks, I, I like it. It looks good. Oh, thanks. And when yeah, I put it and in listen, the, I, oh, go ahead. Whenever, whenever, uh, you know, you want to do that Kickstarter, let me know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm slowly working on it and then working on my book and stuff too. So, and when I get the four issues, I'll put it in a graphic novel just for you, JD. Yes. Cause yeah, you know, I don't like, you don't like issues. issues. I know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Dennis, you want me to play this video? I wouldn't. I mean, it's, I mean, it's like eight minutes long. So, I mean, if you really want to watch that whole thing, I, I go into like a real goofy way with these. So each of the Kickstarters I do, the videos are also kind of connected. It's got like a very Lon Chaney, uh, black and white sort of vibe where the first Kickstarter I did, I'm just wandering through the woods at night. And then the audience, I just happened to meet in the woods. The second one, I'm being chained to a chair in my basement. The third one, I wake up in the woods and I'm covered in blood and there's like a severed hand next to me. So like, it's just this <laughs> ongoing little goofy story that, you know, allows me to talk about the Kickstarter. So, I mean, gotcha. if you want to watch it, we can, but it's very, it's much longer. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't want to go that far into. No, it. no, I mean, no. We'll, don't worry about it. We, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll maybe another time. <laughs> no, no worry. <laughs> yeah, uh, but you know, you, you, you're still you're at eleven five. You did great. You, you passed your goal, so you, you're doing great. One hundred eighty five back is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, let's let's scroll through this. So walk us through this. What do we have? So, uh, like in the graphic novel series, anyways, I best sum it up as it's the story of the world's first werewolf. It's a little bit of horror, a little mythology, a little adventure, a little history. The first book in the series was the origin story, sort of sets everything up. And then each book in the series that follows that goes into different regional mythologies and monsters and folklore and gods and all that stuff. And so the second book went into ancient Arabic mythology, opened the world up to magic and that sort of thing. And this book, the third one, I best describe as H.P. Lovecraft meets Gilgamesh. And it's the same character through each of the books. It's always Solomon. It's just he's sort of going on this journey or odyssey, if you will. Um, So, yeah, the first book was 72 pages. Second one was 72. This one's 96. So they keep creeping up there in terms of the length of each of these books. But, yeah, so that's the that's the. Dime store tour, I suppose, of uh, of the books in general. But I am especially excited about this one. And as I said, it gets pretty dark. <laughs> oh, is this the one that's really dark? Yeah, this is the one that's really dark. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. When I right. uh, one of the funnier things that I had happened to me on this book series, is, or at least this book, anyways, is reading what my editor as she leaves notes as she reads through it, mm-hmm. and so she puts at one point she goes. Hey, you're not going to do this thing, right? And I'm like, scroll, 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 scroll. She goes, okay, okay. Like, you did it. Okay. You're not going to do it again, though, right? Scroll, 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 scroll. Okay, but like, you're done now, right? Scroll, 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 scroll. I hate you. I hate everything. <laughs> I hate you. And she just left me a note at the end that said, uh, I hate it. I love it. I hate you more. And I said, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. So. <laughs> nice. Left you a note, official restraining order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I put the first, I believe it's 20 pages of this book uh, right up here. So cool. So <clears throat> this is the third issue. How many more issues do you see going in the series? So the series is going to be 15 books. I have it mapped mm-hmm. out all the way to the last page of the last book. Um, nice. So there are three five book arcs in total. Cool. 
And yeah, so, like I said, each book goes into different uh, regions, time periods, stuff like that. So the next book, which is already written, that one's set in ancient Egypt. Then we go to Greece, and then uh, we go over to Asia. I want to do like a journey to the West, and then from there, it keeps going. Okay. Very nice. Are you going to do... Uh, I, I... <laughs> Sorry? He's asking, are they going to go into space? Oh, no. <laughs> no, I would, wasn't going to have him go into space. I mean, maybe. I don't know. That doesn't really I'm trying to keep it a little more grounded to the touch. Um, mm. But it, so the series will eventually go into slightly like a uh, future, not like flying cars future, but like just like 20, 30 years beyond now. Although by the time the books get there, it'll probably be present day because it takes about a year to a year and a half uh, for each of these books to come out. So. Mm. Gotcha. So you get the entire book done before you launch. Uh, as much of it as I can. So this is the mm. first time where the book wasn't entirely finished. Uh, the art is all the way done. The coloring is two-thirds done, and then the lettering is pretty much right where the coloring is. So gotcha. it'll be done. Uh, I just got an update from the colorist. It'll probably be done in less than six weeks, which is fine because if anyone's done a Kickstarter, you know how it's like pulling teeth to get people to answer their surveys. So I can't print the books without people answering their surveys because I don't know uh, a what covers they want or B there's a thank you page where they get their names put in the book. And I kind of need to know what their names are so okay. I can put it in the book. So mm -hmm. it's one of those things where I'm waiting on people. So it kind of works out because I have to wait anyways. Gotcha. All right. Nice. Yeah. Well, you got another 12 hours. Yep. So, so people jump on it now. You know? I got to say, too, since I saw him at Baltimore, I read both uh, the first two, and they were really good. Actually, I didn't know you were here you. today, and I actually <laughs> had your book right here in front of oh, me. Oh, there you so. go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it looks amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. I used to make this joke uh, when I first started doing conventions, and then my friend told me not to. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this show, I'm very self-deprecating. And one of the things I used to say was, yes, the, the books are beautiful. Uh, so that way, even if my writing stinks, that they're still nice to look at, to which <laughs> my friend would immediately say, shut up. Your writing's not bad. So stop putting that in people's heads. Hey, Dennis, like, okay, okay, this is the coming. ego show. You got to turn on your ego switch. I know. Yes. Well, that's why I said it's the self-deprecating <laughs> part. I've gotten better. I've gotten better. I've gotten better. Like, I, I, I know I the books are good now. Like, I've always known they're good. But, like, now I, I don't sort of do the self-deprecating stuff. My day job also helps with that because I'm a consultant. And what they say is like, no, you have to like always be confident, even if you don't know what you're doing. So it's like, okay. So now I, I sort of, I do that a lot better. I can. I read it. a quote the other day, and it was like uh, Bruce Lee. I don't remember where the quote was, but um, don't make fun of yourself because your 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 brain starts to believe it, even if like self deprecating, you're making jokes and all that kind of stuff. Fair. They it starts to your your soul starts to believe it, uh, even if you're kidding or not. Um, and I kind of took that to heart because I am also very self-deprecating. Uh, and I kind of stopped doing it a little bit because, uh, you know, he's got a lot I don't have my life. back, you will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> listen, very nice. Like I said, another 11 hours ago, 185 backers, you're good. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, this one was this one jumped out to the biggest um, as well. And then I finally got that elusive project we love uh, tag wow. that I could not get on the first two. So I was very happy with this one. All right. Very nice. Very nice. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, let me see. I think I'm going to pop mine up real quick. Magi's Grace. I didn't skip over anybody, did I? Did, no. did David have one? I, was gonna say, uh, I don't have a Kickstarter, but if you want to go to my website, I'd love to show that off. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, yeah. Did you put it in the in the private in the private? I did. Yes. All right. That's that's what I missed. Okay. No. That's good. Okay. He does it to me all the time. Yeah, I do. I, I straight <laughs> up got Aaron tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, do me a favor. Put it in the put it in the private chat again. Because when I logged on, I logged back in and it deleted everything in the private chat for me. You got I don't it. Know does it. All right. So anyway, this is Magi's Grace. Like another 18 days ago, we're already uh, funded. Um, this is uh, what happens when um, cryptids meet the supernatural. So we have vampires invading Ismith. So it's uh, fish people being invaded by vampires. And Magi, who's a, a, a gun-toting 
Monster Hunter, along with his partner Grace, who's a sword wielding sorceress, they get they get brought in to deal with this situation. So there you go. It's a lot of sexy covers, a lot of fun, a lot of action. There's even a review for it. So if you want, you can scroll down a little bit. There's a link. Click on that link. It'll give you a review, and that'll give you an idea of whether or not this is for you. So there you go. The future right. just says, "Buy this book." All right. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. You know, so that always helps. All right. Cool. All right. Okay. All right. So, Dennis, what do we got here? There oh, it is. David, excuse me. That's okay. Cracktanacomics.com. That's our uh, last, uh, our latest uh, 136 page. Graphic novel, Latent Lightspeed. It is uh, set in the uh, future Earth. Uh, and I taking contemporary things and ideas that happened. It was uh, um, about uh, 25 years after a plague had decimated the uh, solar system. And there are scientists working on cloning technology to be able to help rebuild the, the population. And in other, uh, uh, other planets in the solar system, uh, they uh, didn't fare as well. There's a, a, a planet of aliens that is dying and a general from that planet is uh, essentially kidnapping scientists uh, and trying to get them to use their cloning technology to be able to rebuild their species. Uh, Late Lightspeed is an 84, it starts off as an 84 year old scientist with a lot of uh, physical and emotional problems and his daughter Galaxy Lightspeed. Uh, they end up um, being uh, chased and hunted down by this general and his son. Uh, Late Lightspeed has a heart attack in the middle of it, and uh, Laxy Lightspeed downloads his uh, his brain into a nine year old clone of himself. So it is an eighty four year old man and the clone of a nine year old boy, uh, and them still being chased by. Uh, these two uh, aliens who are trying to get them to use their technology to rebuild their uh, species. It is uh, it is everything you want from sci-fi, action, adventure, uh, uh, aliens, spaceships, all that great stuff. I, I can't be happier with the way it uh, turned out. Uh, I'm, I'm really proud of it. Uh, and like I said, about three years of, of kind of toiling with the story and, and getting it to where I'm really making sure I'm honing in on the theme, themes, which are... Mm -hmm. uh, is family and uh, how we deal with as a species, how we deal with getting older and how sometimes as human beings, we don't really deal with it very well um, with lots of the Botox and the face slips that lifts and the <laughs> people, people in their seventies dressing like they're in their twenties and, and all that stuff. Uh, um, uh, so it kind of deals with those kind of themes of growing old gracefully and, and understanding that with age comes wisdom. Um, and just because uh, uh, you have wrinkles doesn't mean that your worth is diminished in any way. In fact, those wrinkles uh, all represent uh, um, knowledge that you've gained. Uh, so it really deals with those kind of themes. The Offspring, that's uh, Omnibus number two, which collects issues uh, 13 through 25. Uh, and I actually just finished uh, most of the pencils. I have a couple little details that I put in. Most of the pencils of issue 26 today. So I'm going to start inking issue 26 and getting uh, it was 26 starts season three of The Offspring. So issues one through uh, 12 are collected in a trade omnibus. Uh, issues 13 through 25 are collected in a trade omnibus, uh, seasons one and two. Um, and that's a story of four kids who come to find out that they are uh, uh, the catalysts for the universe. Uh, and when we meet them, they are at their uh, 20-somethings, and they are at their lowest point ever. They have, in this lifetime that they are experiencing right now, um, have um, grown up in very abusive homes, uh, mentally and physically abusive, ho abusive homes. And when we meet them, they're at their lowest point. One is in prison. One uh, will just try, or Vince just tries to commit suicide. Uh, uh, will is kind of hiding out in the place that he feels the safest. Um, and it's really their exploration of how they see themselves, how they see the world um, as not a very safe place uh, to be. The tagline is, where's your safe place for the offspring? 
and they start to develop um, not only a friendship for each other, for these three t kids that don't trust each other at all, uh, but they start to see each other as family. Uh, as we get into season two, uh, there's a fourth member of our three-member group that um, kind of throws a wrench in the works. Um, they go to save uh, their friend Megan, who was kind of ripped from the timeline. Um, and they find out where and how she was ripped from the timeline and the first time travel story in the American Civil War. Uh, and now as we're getting into season three, they find themselves being thrust further and further back into the past. Uh, right now, it's uh, the issue 26 that I'm working on. They find themselves on the Lusitania in World War I. Um, and if you know anything about World War I history, uh, the Lusitania has maybe not the greatest ending in the world to its uh, <laughs> to its one of its voyages, uh, to its last voyage. Uh, but they continue through uh, 26 through the, the the next season three, just being thrust back and back and back into time. Uh, there is a, a method to the madness of why they're being thrust back in time further and further and further. Um, and I'll get to that as I go. I don't want to give too much away. <laughs> All right, cool. Now you don't do crowdfunders, so I mean, how how are you? Obviously, you're selling on your website, but are you selling it on any other platforms like Amazon or something? Yeah, yeah Amazon. Um, I do most of my stuff through Amazon and cons. Um, I'm also mm -hmm. on Global Comics. You can find digital on uh, most of my books on, glo on globalcomics.com. Also, um, I do pretty good traffic through Amazon and on the conventions uh, trail that I do up here in upstate New York, where I am. I do have some books in local comic book shops that sell well, also. Um, but really, it's just about peddling the wares online to be able to get people to the website, which will take them to Amazon. Hmm. Gotcha. Now, if you click on these links, they'll, they'll take you right to Amazon. They'll take you right to Amazon, yep. All right, cool. Now, if how you scroll you down clicking? a little bit, you can see all the individual trades of uh, the of the offspring and uh, the Omnibus One. So six individual trades, and that's collecting both all, all seasons one and two, and then Omnibus Two right there, or Omnibus One that collects issues one, uh, season one, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Now... Uh, the the printing on the books is it something um, like are you selling it on Amazon and you're fulfilling or are they fulfilling it for you like through Lightning Source? Uh, a little bit of both. So the um, Amazon, see so if you order from Amazon, they fulfill the order. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it, it really kind of works out where I don't need to have a thousand books in a box somewhere in my basement. Right. Mm -hmm. um, when I know that I'm going to a con or know that I want to put uh, some books into a store, I travel from upstate New York to Ohio, uh, to, to North Carolina, fairly frequently okay. um, in, in my daily life. So I will try to get books in stores as much as I possibly can, um, mm -hmm. which is difficult from time to time, uh, but also fun because I get a lot of, of uh, um, traffic on my uh, website and traffic on uh, all my social medias through the people that find me in those places. Um, but for the mm -hmm. most part, I can print books kind of for myself on demand as much as I need. I'll print 10 to 25, sometimes a little bit more than that, depending on what I need them for, um, fairly cheaply uh, through Amazon. Okay. Cool. Nice. It's nice. not bad. It works out for me. Um, and I hope to continue to grow to where maybe I will need 100, 500 books printed in my basement and I can just start getting them out to people. <laughs> Um, right. But right now, it works well for, for me and what I need to do. All right, cool. Now, how long have you been doing this? Uh, let's see. So um, I would say issue one of the Offspring came out about six years ago. Oh, okay. Seven mm -hmm. years ago. So I've been toiling around for, for a while. Um, and uh, the Offspring is going to be 50 issues. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I'm just working on issue 26 right now. Uh, but I plan to get out at least five. I try to get out at least five to six books a year. Right. Nice. Yeah. It's a good schedule. Nice. It's not bad. It works mm -hmm. out pretty well. I, I can get an issue of the offspring fully done, colored, lettered, um, um, uh, ready to go. And um, on a good, if I'm, if there's nothing else going on two months, sometimes mm -hmm. three months, depending on if it's holiday time or summer where I'm taking vacations with my families or things like that. But I can usually get out a book um, within two months. All right. Cool. 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 Very nice. All right, um, gentlemen, 
So I got another question for you guys. Now I can ask you, C. Michael. So C. Michael Landing was supposed to. He's not feeling well, so so he called out sick today, some bitch. Uh, but um, yeah, he he gave me a question. I, I read it to you guys earlier. I'm not gonna ask yeah. this question. Uh, but so I got my own damn question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, he's just I'll bringing it up. So like, that's why I'm bringing C. Michael's question to tell you I'm not gonna ask his question. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much, yeah. He can come. He can come on his damn self and ask it himself. That's how I feel about it. <laughs> like, all right. So no, no. There's always other opportunities. He'll be back one day. Um. So my question is, what is the one thing you're looking forward to achieving in comics? You know, what what is that thing that you want to achieve? You know, beyond everything else, what's what's that one crazy thing you want to achieve? So, uh, Sean, what are your thoughts? What do you what, what do you what are you looking to achieve? I mean, right now, my crazy thing is getting to issue 12, because I know that's a huge feat for, for a new writer. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. And that's fair. That's good. That's that's a good one. Yeah, I like that. Now, once um, I get past that, then I'll have other, other you know, aspirations. But get through that mm -hmm. first one, then move on to the next. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. That's cool. Uh, David, what are, you, what are you looking to achieve? Yeah, same thing as Sean. I mean, I just put out a 135-page graphic novel. Uh, so now it's really focusing on issue 26 and trying to get um, the small stepping stones done for that issue um, with with always the bigger, the bigger picture in mind of trying to get season three done then season four and getting to issue 50. Um, it's always, you know, the plan to get it out to the public as much as I possibly can in the most um, trying to find creative ways as somebody who who understands that there are a million of me there's you know six of us sitting here six other people that are just like me sitting here on the panel mm -hmm. um, and trying to find the most creative ways to be able to get my book out to where um people are interested in, in reading it and hoping that it's um unique or or um, interesting enough for people to go oh yeah I'll, I'll check that out and then keep them wanting to check it out uh by doing those uh, those fun stories i know that as an indie creator, um, people hearing sometimes, oh, I'm going to do 50 issues of this book, is a little daunting for people who uh, who do read indie comics because they're like, oh, you're not going to get some. Sometimes they don't get the three issues. Um, mm -hmm. So what I did was I created, I have um, six of them out right now, 24-page um, one-shots that mm -hmm. are different genres, different characters, has nothing to do with my 50-issue uh, uh, ongoing series, The Offspring. Uh, but it, I try to see that as like a bridge um, mm -hmm. to be able to see my work and see my style, or, you know, whether it's art or uh, art or writing, uh, and see if they like it enough to be able to jump on board uh, for The Offspring. Uh, and uh, there have been some times where people will contact me and say, hey, I read The Sock Hop Killer. Uh, which is one of my horror uh, one shots. I really liked it. I'm, I'm going to pick up the first trade of the offspring and, and hope that they continue for the ride for the next trades. Um, so really my hope is to just to continue to build my brand here of uh, the big blue left hand um, and hope that people continue to um, uh, like reading in them as much as I like creating them. Gotcha. So you're left-handed? I'm a Southpaw, yes. Oh, okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair no, enough. he's correct handed. Correct handed. There's right handed <laughs> and correct handed. <laughs> okay, if you say so. <laughs> uh, a typical right handed. He's response. got a sign in everything, JD. It's right there. A typical <laughs> right handed response. If you, you right say people. so. <laughs> Try living in our left handed world what, for one day. You'd fall apart <laughs> crying on the, on the floor. <laughs> uh, listen, I, I watch I watch MMA, so always open to that right to that to that uh, right leg kick. That's all I can say. Right to the dome. Um, Aaron, what are your thoughts? It's, it's funny. I I uh, finishing Gollins was one of my big goals, and that's done. Mm -hmm. I think now I'm always shifting goals. I I like knocked was less more on story for me. It just I wanted to draw what I wanted to draw. I like drawing Halloween. I draw a Halloween picture every year for Halloween. And I like Barbarian, so I, I just wanted to draw what I wanted to draw. But I guess just kind of developing... I'm, I plan to just keep going with him for the foreseeable future. I might do other projects in between. But I always like, like Yusagi Ojimbo and how certain creators could just take one character 
and just that's all they do. They just kind of mm-hmm. like JD does Oswald. I mean, there's something kind of cool about that. Like you're associated or connected, you know, with that. So knock that I guess is my take at like just doing this character in various stories and building upon him and just sticking with that for now. Uh, I guess making my own little publishing house, which I'm slowly doing over time with all my books, and then draw the ultimate story when knocked slays Oswald. Because <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that would That's be right. the ultimate story. <laughs> That's all right. I, I I I would have a definite. You can feel free to do that. <laughs> I, I have I have I have a definitive response. Definitive so, response. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I have the artist, and I, and I have the artist to 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 knock it out too. To knock it out, Gray. He's gonna beat me to it. <laughs> Erase it. Who can get the story out? Of who kills who? Who first in the yeah. story? Well, well, who kills who more spectacularly? <laughs> That's true. I think your character probably make mine explode with a wave of a hand or something. <laughs> so, all right, cool, fair enough. Uh, Peter, what are your thoughts? Um. I don't know. I'm not quite sure. Uh, I don't really have any goals. Um, never really, you know, never really thought I'd get this far to begin with, right? You know, and whenever I think of quitting, something always like last, you know, last year I got I got hurt and I suffered a brain injury and Ouch. I took a year off and I didn't do anything for a year and I, and I thought, well, maybe I won't do anything again. And it just, mm-hmm. for some strange reason, it didn't happen, right? You know, the opportunities just, you know, every time I tried to shut that door, and then, you know, the window opened, right? So I guess it's some of it must be fate or meant to be or whatever. But as far as, like, accomplishments, I'm not quite sure, you know. Um, like I said, I, I originally never, it never, this was never ever part of the plan. You know, the plan was to win and bullshit my way through some contest and freaking you know and never ever thought i'd win it and then you know and then just kind of went went from there right you know so i guess the goal is for now just you know hopefully get (laughs) get finished writing what i'm writing now and get it out and get get it completed on time and you know and, and then just not worry about what comes next. All right. That's cool. All right. Dennis. So my main goal is that I would love it if the books could pay for themselves. Like if I moved enough books either through the Kickstarter or through conventions or whatever it was to just offset the cost of making the book and then maybe a little bit extra because there are other stories that I would like to tell, not in the same universe, like totally different themes, settings and all that jazz, but I'm not going to start those other books if I'm already like in a very deep hole with these. So my main goal would be that the books at some point pay for themselves. So then I can write these other stories and make these other books and have different books coming out at different times and all that stuff. Um, And I suppose like super crazy, not really a goal, but I guess a pipe dream would just be, it'd be kind of cool to see it as like an animated TV show or something like that, like a Castlevania style and definitely not live action. They just don't <laughs> do werewolves very well live action for the most part. So I'd rather see like a Castlevania esque animated series. That'd be fun. I get that question a lot. They're like, Oh, mm-hmm. you, would you like to see it on like Amazon or Netflix? I'm like, yeah, sure. But not live action. <laughs> America werewolf in London. Come on. They don't do practical anymore, though. They do, like, not <laughs> oh, great yeah. CG or, like, I met uh, a guy at a con who had a werewolf movie, and he had the actual werewolf costume behind him, and the mouth doesn't move. So the oh. mouth's just stuck open all the time. And I'm like, so the whole movie, the werewolf's just got his mouth open. <laughs> and they're like, yep, you just cut away real fast. I said, okay, this is why I don't want to do live action movie. <laughs> gotcha. You just see the guy, the guy who's in it, you just see That's his eyeballs in yeah. the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, Tom, what do, what are you looking to achieve? Man? So when I started comics, my whole thing was I want to get to Critter 100. That was that was mm. my thing. Nice. Uh, and uh, you know, just like has been talked about here, people are like, you can't do that. That's you don't even do five issues. And I'm like, I'm going to do Critter 100. And I'm just when it happens, I'm going to take the issue. 
I'm going to smear it in your face. <laughs> that's 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 the chip that has been on my shoulder for a long time. So, um, you know, we 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 had a really nice run when we were doing comics monthly. Uh, everything kind of went crazy when we went to Aspen, and now we've been back with crowdfunding. So, Critter's been off schedule for like five years, uh, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm really excited to get back to it. Um, and uh, we'll be we'll be done with Critter 25 as of this arc, and then we'll be working. On, I'm already actively working on what will be volume seven, which will take us to issue 30 in 2026. So um, that's, that's sort of the, the, the pie in the sky. Like, let's, let's do that. Uh, let's, let's make that happen. Um, but then, you know, along the way, I have all these other stories that I'm writing too, which again, takes away from just doing that one character um, mm-hmm. because I just, I have too much in my brain that I have to get out. So um, th- th- sort of the sub goals is I want to finish, my stories because all of these other stories that I have penny for your soul or some minor and so on legend of Oz, they all have finales. Like I know where they end. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to be able to sort of put a series to bed at the same time, you know, be like, Hey, we've done our 10 volumes of this thing. And now it's, it's complete. It's finished. It's done. And, and it's no longer in here and I can, you know, create new things, uh, as we go forward. So, um, you know, that's all of these books are in, 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 you know, not ending in the next arc or anything, but, um, every time we do an arc, it's like, you kind of feel like, Hey, we're one step closer to actually finishing this thing. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and then you just hope that, you know, whatever finale you have planned is, uh, uh, good enough for the fans to be like, wow, that was, that's a nice bookend to, you know, this whole thing. So, um, yeah, I just, I want to finish, I want to finish what we have. And then uh, if I can manage to, to live long enough to get Critter to 100, that'll be great. All right, cool. But Tom, let it be known. I think you'll make it. I I'm going to make sure make uh, somebody needs a comic in their face. So I'm going to make you know, sure that it hey, you, you You can rub it in mine because I'll just take it and be like, thank you. <laughs> thanks for the comic, Tom. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> I'll sign so, yeah. it for you before I smear it in your face. All right, cool. I appreciate okay. that. Yes. All right, cool. Um, for myself, yeah, it's similar to Tom. It's just to complete the complete the series, complete the Oswald Chronicles, complete Tall Tales, uh, complete Dreamweavers, uh, complete um, Magi's Grace, uh, and and there's a couple other series that I've floating around. Reaver eventually gets to something called Starpoint, Dreamweavers, all this all this different stuff. So we'll see what happens. It'll be interesting next few years. It's just a uh, when it when it comes down to that, you know, because we're we're I'm starting to get to a point where I'm actually looking at moving back into the direct market and uh, moving Oswald into color. Um, so, you know, it's going to be an ex- interesting uh, next few years. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. But gentlemen, we made it to hour two. You guys are all great and fantastic. Thank you so much. And let's start with Dennis, please. Where can they find you and your work, sir? Uh, you can find me on all social media, either at World's Most Okayest DM, which is my show name from the podcast that I'm on, and also at Hive Head Studios. You can find my books on the Kickstarter right now, at least for the next like 11 ish hours, uh, at lichenbook.com. But if you'd also just like to catch up with the other stuff, I have a website, hiveheadstudios.com. I've had a podcast now for. Oh God, eight years now. Uh, it's a D and D podcast. Uh, it's like an improv comedy show draped in the loose skin of Dungeons and Dragons. It's called Botched, a D and D podcast, and we're our current season is set in the SCP universe. So if you're familiar with that, we don't uh, particularly take anything super super serious, but it's like a little funny, a little horrific, all that kind of stuff. And you can find that on all your podcatchers at Botched Podcast. Cool, Sean. Where can they find you and your work, sir? Uh, so right now I'm on Facebook, Twitter, uh, TikTok, Reddit, anywhere I can find that someone can look at the book. Uh, Sean Wood underscore writer. And that's all across the board. All right, cool. David, where can they find you and your work, sir? Nice. Yeah, you can find me on my website, correcthandedcomics.com. And any social media, if you type in correct. Correct handed that uh, that big blue left hand will pop up and uh, uh, you can <laughs> like, follow, share, comment, all that good stuff. All right, cool. Aaron, uh, you can find me on uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Humphreys Illustration. My last name is spelled on there, R E S at the end. Uh, just look, I have a website and a big cart. I think it's Humphreys Illustration at Big Cartel. If you type it in the Google, it'll come up. That's where I sell all my stuff right now. All 
So, yep, yep. All right. Cool. Peter? Um, I'm on Facebook. I, I, some of the titles are available on Global Comics, you know, and then the other ones, I guess you just find through preview. So I'm going to be a featured guest at Bog City Comic Con in May and um, East Coast uh, Comic Convention in, uh, I'll be a featured guest there in, in June. And then uh, for the Freddie Beach Fan Fest, I'm going to be a featured guest there in, in August. So if you're in, if you're in Atlantic Canada, you know, then drop by. All right, cool. Mr. Tom, where can he find you, work, sir? Uh, yeah, so we pretty much live on Facebook and everything filters out from there. Uh, you guys are welcome to, to friend me up uh, as Tom. We have the Big Dogging page on Facebook as well. Uh, we're on, uh, we're on the X, we're on the Instagram, we're on the, we're on the TikTok, all those things, uh, BDI comics. And, you know, we have a Patreon as well. If you like to watch how the, the soup is made, that's what we, we do on our Patreon. You get to watch everything go from logos to lines, to designs, to colors, to finished product. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, uh, like I was saying earlier, we're, I'm going to be at a ton of conventions starting in May and June. So, um, we'll be all over the country traveling around again all right cool uh so you can find me here just about every sunday of uh, of the of the of the damn year uh although i do take on occasion take one off uh instagram facebook twitter all those different places on the jd caldwell the oswald chronicles.com tolltalesonline.com and currently on kickstarter with magi's grace uh another 18 days to so go check it out and just to let everybody know in the show notes all the links to all these creators' campaigns and websites, they're in the show notes. So click on those links. Go buy those books. These are fantastic creators. They all deserve your support. So please, go help them out. Go buy some great books. And one more time, just remember, read more books. Read indie comics. Read more indie comics, especially ours. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, man. All right.